So, is there life after philosophy? I'm interviewing philosophy majors years after graduation. Let's hear what they have to say. I'm Christopher Annadale. Hi, welcome to Life After Philosophy. This episode is a look back at season two of this podcast with excerpts and a little bit of commentary. Season two was published from January through March of 2024. It consisted of eight episodes, episodes 18 through 25. In season two, I interviewed seven men and one woman. Two of the men were priests. For the first time in this podcast, I interviewed two non-students, people who had not been students of mine and had not graduated from any institution that I taught at. Episode 18, the first of the season, was my interview with The Farmer. This is my friend and philosophy colleague, Stephen McGinley. This was the longest episode so far, and one of the most enjoyable. The clip I'm going to share with you now starts at about the 10-minute mark into episode 18, and in it, Farmer McGinley talks about modernity, root fungus, and the poetic gaze. The excerpt is about eight minutes long. Here it is. The narrative normally ends there, like, look, this sucks, we're screwed, we have to come up with chemical solutions to these, to what are really technologically induced problems. Right? Or, like, or, else, or else millions will starve. Or else millions will starve. Yeah. The, the, one of the classes that I now teach, um, Masanobu Fukuoka and Regenerative Agriculture, lays out a different sort of gaze on the world that actually allows for increased fertility of the soil and increased fertility of the crops. So Fukuoka is a no-till farmer before that was a thing. Mm -hmm. He's also or a no-till organic farmer, which is like of grains, of rice particularly, mm -hmm. which is exceedingly rare. And he outproduces all of the best conventional chemical rice farmers in Japan. Wow. How does he do it? After 30 years, he's built up soil such that he, the, the way that he, the, what he calls the sort of way of farming, which he has a book by that title, mm -hmm. is um, essentially an Aristotelian uh, acting in accordance with, uh, like, art imitates nature. He's, he's operating on that axiom mm -hmm. without knowing Aristotle. Yeah. And um, so, so then we sort of come back to, as, as an undergraduate, I was interested in learning the Gospels more. And the philosophy, you know, insofar as grace presupposes and perfects nature, had dovetailed in such a way that I needed, I wanted to, like, get my hands dirty. So I started a little garden and uh, planted tomatoes and broccoli next to each other, which failed miserably. Because tomatoes and broccoli, which I didn't know, are, are um, enemies to each other. Their plant groups excrete exudates that attract the pests of the other plant. So what I learned eventually was it's not just about, you know, like individual substances, right? Mm -hmm. You have to take it, in, the farmer has to take into account substances always in relation. And that what, what modernity has done in abstracting substances from their constitutive relations is, is of untold damage, both to us and to everything else. Um, the, you know, we, we could go in the political realm here, but let's not. Um, the, the key here is like in the agricultural world, we've done this such that, like here's a great example. Plants, are relatively ineffective at getting all of the nutrients they need because their root space, their roots can only reach so far. And so they've worked out synergistic relationships with fungus and bacteria. Mm -hmm. Mycorrhizal fungi is among them. And those fungal networks bring nutrients to the plant by the plant signaling, exchanging sugars for whatever it needs, phosphorus, potassium, otherwise slow moving nutrients. As soon as you spray or till, you've 
de destroyed those fungal networks. We have destroyed the fungal network. We've only recently, in the past 20 years, discovered these mycorrhizal fungal networks, which every other generation sort of operated, um, let's say, was successful to the degree that they didn't destroy them and uh, brought about plague to the degree that they did. Mm -hmm. We have s held ourselves up, we've buoyed ourselves from plague by dumping chemicals immediately onto the plants, like as in proximately onto the plants, into their root zone to make up for the, the nutrient deficiency that has arisen from our destruction of the soil. But now we know that like these fungal networks are so much more efficient than we are, but that we've destroyed them so much with our methods that there are people trying to produce nanobots <laughs> to do what mycorrhizal fungi does and move nutrients through the soil itself mm -hmm. to plants based on whatever our technological apparatus indicates, like this plant needs boron. Oh, send a robot to bring it to it. I wish I were joking, but I've, oh I've now, I, I'm not. But the fundamental sort of, this begins first with, let's say, like a gaze on what is. Mm -hmm. And the classical gaze is um, even of instructional farming texts. So we can think here, classic instructional farming texts from ancient Greece or Hesiod's works in days and um, Virgil's Gorgics, those classic farming texts are poems. Mm -hmm. They're, they have instructions, like when to plow. They even have instructions on like who to marry. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Hesiod has lines about like, yeah, he, his, his is very detailed. Um, plowing naked under certain, at certain times, it's great. I haven't done that yet, it's on my... <laughs> Got to figure out when to do that, but um, right, like the the point here would be their instructional advice is subordinate to the poetic form because they're poems. What that is indicating, it seems to me, is that the poetic gaze is actually the primary gaze of the farmer. Well, that's fascinating, right? That's, that's, that's interesting, and that. In 10,000 years, people will still read Virgil and, and Hesiod. Mm -hmm. They won't read USDA instruction manuals. No. I don't think. Because they're boring, first. Mm -hmm. Second, because they're rife with error. Mm -hmm. Third, because they've brought about the denuding of American soils at rates that have hitherto been unimaginable. Mm -hmm. uh, and fourth, the practices have brought about, let's say... Um, extraordinary nutrient deficiency in the plant and animal uh, that human societies are contingent on such that, and there's some research out there that indicates that obesity is actually not first a temperance problem, but first a nutrient deficiency problem. Right. That your body is crying out for micronutrients that the food lacks. And so is constantly signaling, you need to eat more because I need more nutrients. But we're eating high calorie foods. We don't have a calorie deficiency. Right. That is clearly the case. We have a nutrient density deficiency. So, you know, anyway, all of this is, is it seems to me, related first to the, to the, let's say, the inversion of the poetic gaze to the instructional gaze. For more of that interview, check out episode 18 the farmer. In episode 19, I interviewed Matt Sampson, a former seminarian, student of mine, who now lives in North Dakota. He works with the energy industry, but we talked mostly about his passion for teaching and youth ministry. The excerpt I'm going to share with you is about two minutes long and comes from near the very beginning of that episode. The setup for this is that Matt is explaining why he had, after years, of being out of touch, called me on the phone out of the blue. Here it is. Yeah, the, the reason I did call was I did have a question on the relationship with uh, faith and reason. And 
I, I remember one of your lectures back in the day at the pre-theology program there at the Mount. And the more I thought about Mount St. Mary's and the philosophy courses that I took there post when after I left the Mount, the more I realized just how much those courses made an impact on my life. And I think as a student, you know, any student, whether seminarian or a uh, regular student, when you, when you, at least for myself, I guess, you, I, the philosophy was kind of a little abstract for my taste. You know, I was always, you know, math, science, equations, very structured. And I thought philosophy was just a little too abstract for me. Uh, but then after, especially taking the courses um, at the Mount, I think the curriculum really just put put things together and gave kind of the structure that I was looking for that I might not have realized um, from the outside looking in. And one thing I remember very clearly is our first cosmology class with uh, Father Donahue we had that semester. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about, uh, it was theoria and praxis and techne. And I was so overwhelmed. I was like, I, I'm not sure what any of this is. And as we went through the courses and then with the supplemental courses with your, your course in logic, I know I've told many people post-seminary, I wish logic was a required course for every student at every university or even in high school at all levels. And I'm just so grateful for the opportunity. And I, I can talk more into it in a specific circumstance, but uh, I, I think I, the words that I used when I spoke with you is it was really life-changing. That's from episode 19, The Landman. In episode 20, I interviewed the first non-student, somebody who had not studied philosophy with me or at my institution, and this was Landon Di Pasquale. He lives in Illinois. He's a graduate of Wheaton College and a friend recommended to me by Father Josh Miller, whom I interviewed in season one. I have two excerpts from this episode that I'll share with you right now. In the first, Landon talks about his conversion experience and his insight that you can't succeed in living differently from how you believe. This excerpt comes from near the beginning of episode 20, and is about four minutes long. Yeah, uh, I would say it really starts at Wheaton when I was studying philosophy because I went into Wheaton as a Protestant and I left as a Catholic. And that happened because of my study of philosophy. Uh, it was primarily Boethius that ended up converting me to the faith. Um, I started off reading Aquinas and Anselm and Augustine, but for some reason it was Boethius in particular that really resonated with me. And Obviously, the Consolation is a, a huge, important, uh, monumental work in philosophy, but it was actually his his work on De Ternitate that really got me down the route of realizing that Catholicism was the truth. And so it took me a few years, but my uh, senior year at Wheaton, I ended up converting to Catholicism, joining the church. And that would, would not have happened without philosophy. That was a huge part of that transition. Well, that's amazing. That's that, That's interesting to me because I teach Boethius uh, every every spring to my freshmen here at Mount St. Mary's University. Was your encounter with philosophy then a very cerebral thing? Was this a case of a kind of intellectual intellect leading the the affects and the, the rest of your life? Uh, did, did, was that the kind of person that you were back in college? Yeah, that absolutely was the case. Uh, I Using Augustine's analogy, I definitely had a conversion of the mind before I had a conversion of the will. I was really getting into philosophy. And, and what it forced me to do was ask questions that I wasn't going to engage otherwise. So I was reading all of these medievals, and I kind of pushed the Catholic stuff off the side and said, you know what, that Catholic stuff, that's not for me. I don't need to worry about that. That's that's great that they do that, but that's that's not me. And I was finally forced to come to that question of, if I believe everything else about their philosophical system, I can't just ignore that piece. So I at least need to engage it and understand why they believe what they believe. And so in doing so, I, I came to this conclusion of, contrary to how I was brought up, believing that Catholics were crazy and a weird cult and all sorts of other goofy stuff, I came to a conclusion that what Catholics believed, especially these philosophers I was reading, was reasonable. And as soon as I made that shift, 
it was over for me. I, I There was no chance for me not to become Catholic because as soon as you make the move from this is a reasonable belief, I think you're forced to ask the question, why don't I believe that? Is my belief more reasonable than this other belief? And while I didn't see it myself, I wasn't admitting it to myself as it was happening, my friends around me all saw what was going on. They're like, you're becoming Catholic. I was like, no, I'm not becoming Catholic. I, <laughs> I, I couldn't see it. And then one day, uh, I think it was in between my sophomore and junior year, I kind of woke up one morning and, and it wasn't this great epiphany. It wasn't the heavens opening up. It wasn't anything like that. I kind of woke up and went, oh, I think I'm Catholic. And it was very, very much like that. And I said, okay, well, I guess I need to do something about this. And so even then I had had a conversion of the intellect, but not the will. And so it was, oh, I, I know I need to become Catholic, but I'll become Catholic later. That, that'll be something that comes, comes down the road. Maybe if I go to grad school or do something like that, I'll do that. Not now. And what I found out very quickly, uh, again, a, I would say a very important philosophical learning, a really practical one, you cannot live differently than how you believe. It will ultimately destroy you. And so as I kept going to the Protestant church I was going to, I started to realize after a couple months, like, this is not going to work. I can't continue to say, I believe this stuff and not engage Catholicism completely. And so uh, it was another year and a half before I could go through RCIA because of when I hit that. But at that point, I was effectively Catholic in every way, but having been received in the church. I was going to Mass every Sunday. I believed everything the church taught. I was completely on board. Uh, and it was really about waiting to go through the process in order to become a real member of the church. In this second excerpt from episode 20, Landon talks about his work on the side as a firearms instructor and how his work instructing people in the proper handling of firearms has drawn upon his philosophy education. This excerpt starts at about the 28.30 mark in episode 20 and is about two minutes long. Here it is. From a practical standpoint, so on the side, uh, I work as a firearms instructor. So I live here in Illinois, and part of my job is to teach people to be proficient with firearms, uh, help people that want to get concealed carry permits, help them understand uh, what performance looks like in a firearms context, and philosophy pervades all of that. So it first of all pervades your approach to firearms in general. If you approach firearms in terms of a craftsman looking to build virtues, you are going to have a much better time than approaching it either in a um, purely self-defense mindset or maybe just a skills mindset or maybe uh, a like a battle mindset. I found that virtue is essential there. And I think there's a reason why uh, in the past soldiers had heavy philosophical training, especially officers, in order to do their job. Is this a question of asking what's the role of firearms training and, and use and ability in a, in a well-lived life? Is, is that the kind of contextual knowledge you're thinking of? I think that's an essential part, but I think even the practical things of how you grip your gun appropriately, how you manage recoil control, how you get on your sights is a question of building virtues, avoiding vices, practical virtues and practical vices, and coming to a golden mean as opposed to trying to go to an extreme of either uh, one way or the other. So let's use the, the classic example is in firearm circles, there tend to be two camps, accuracy and speed. And you could look at both of those and their extremes as vices. Neither of those are bad things in and of themselves, but taken to their extremes, if you do pure accuracy and no speed, that's a vice. In a firearms context, if you could land the perfect shot, but it took you two hours to land that shot, that's not particularly effective. Yeah. Likewise, if you are capable of going incredibly fast and not hitting anything, that's also not particularly effective. For more of Landon's story, check out episode 20, The Convert. In episode 21, I interviewed another Mount St. Mary's colleague of mine, Dr. John Paul Heil. I remember when John Paul, in, in the mid-20-teens, was a student of ours. After graduating, he went away to the University of Chicago and on a Fulbright and came back with a PhD. He now teaches at Mount St. Mary's with me. I have two short excerpts from this episode to share. In the first, John Paul talks about a quotation from St. John Paul II and its significance for him and his intellectual life. This comes from the 16 
minute and 40 second mark in the episode and is one minute long. One of the uh, quotations that's been very influential on, that has come to be very influential in my time as a historian is JP2's, like the the first line of his pontificate, Mm -hmm. right? Jesus Christ, the redeemer of man, is at the center of the universe and of history. And if you take that seriously, Mm. as he does over the course of his pontificate, that has massive historical implications. Because what this means is that you, in fact, cannot separate history from the truth. Brilliant. Um, Because history as a human experience, not just as a study, but as like we are all living in history. And we are all looking towards the past and towards the future. Like our experience of this is fundamentally a pursuit of truth. Right. Which finds its center and its fullness in the person of Christ. Right. This right. history is tending eschatologically towards union with the divine, towards right. beatitude. The second excerpt from my interview with Dr. Heil is part of his advice to potential philosophy students. He comments on the relationship between the study of philosophy, and happiness. This comes from the 35-minute mark in episode 21 and is about one minute long. Sure, I would have three pieces of advice. They're very simple. The first is, if you're you're concerned about this as a risk, don't conceive of it as a risk. Like, philosophy, and I I can say this with all honesty, because it happened to me. Teaching philo- sorry, studying philosophy will make you happier. It will make you happier. It will also make you in some ways sadder, right, insofar as it will reveal to you things about yourself that perhaps you wish had stayed veiled. But in the end, that will open up, like, gateways towards a greater and deeper happiness than you would have ever thought possible. So that's, that's the first piece of advice. Those excerpts are from my interview with John Paul Heil, the historian, in episode 21. In episode 22, I interviewed Father Judd Bolger. He is a Dominican friar and the chaplain at Providence College in Rhode Island and a former graduate student of mine. He's also one of the main figures in the musical group, the Hillbilly Thomists. In this four-minute excerpt from about the 10-minute mark in episode 22, I ask and Father Justin answers a question about whether young people today have more philosophical or theological questions for the church, for priests, for chaplains like him, what kind of uncertainties they face. Here's the excerpt. Yeah, let me ask you. Let me ask you a question about that. I I uh, have asked other priests that I've interviewed on this podcast a, a question which I associate in the the dim uh, recesses of my memory with our mutual friend Monsignor Stuart Swetland, mm-hmm. who I think either he or or someone I've confused with him uh, told me once that a, a lot of young people today have questions that they might bring to a priest or a chaplain or a pastor which are as much or more philosophical questions than they are theological questions. They're, they're questions about the, the nature of truth or the, the possibility of human excellence or, or how, how can I determine what virtue is, what, how, to, how, how to design my life in a way, that I, the way that's, that's something more than just the product of my will. Is that something you found reflected in your years of campus ministry so far? Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. There, there are those questions um, about, um, yeah, truth in general. I mean, it's it's interesting. Our our motto up here at Providence College is Veritas, truth. So Excellent. we are um, we are interested in in talking about it and um, in promoting it. Of course, uh, truth in in what you study, but we're also proposing that you know truth is a person. And so a lot of students, yeah, we'll, we'll have, we'll have questions about that. And so, yeah, we could go into that. But one thing I do notice, I don't know, it seems like a lot of students also just want to think about God too. So this is, yeah, this is philosophical. It's also theological. Um, 
you know, a lot of our students will study the five ways of Aquinas and, and come to terms with the question of God. And, and, I, and I hear, especially through our RCIA program, which we've, we've got a lot of students in that, over 30 uh, this year and last year, um, a lot of baptisms. So you know, students coming to terms with that, with, you know, is, is, is God real, you know? Um, and, and if he is, who is he? And, and does he love me? So I would say there are those existential kind of theological questions as well that, that I encounter. There was, we, we do all kinds of things in campus ministry. One of the things we do is uh, we, we have service trips. And so we took a service trip to, to Guatemala. And there, there was a student who was just kind of like dead set against the church. And she wanted to go on this trip. She thought it'd be fun. She likes serving. Mm -hmm. But um, she, she thought, you know, the church is against me. I'm against the church. And through this uh, service, this experience of, of faith-based service, uh, she really did a 180 and began to see the, you know, the, the truth of, yeah, the, the human dignity, why we serve, serve the poor, those in need, these, these questions are, are ultimately answered in, in the rich tradition of, of, the, of the church and, and her social teaching. And, um, but it was through that experience of serving along other faithful people, um, beside, besides a, you know, working along with a friar, reflecting on the, on what they were doing in light of the faith that she had this conversion experience. And so now, now she's in RCIA, uh, which is really, really beautiful. But I, I definitely see these, I mean, in one sense, I, I would wish for, for more kind of like articulate philosophical discussions, uh, here, uh, but, but I'll take existential ones too, you know, just who am I, who is God, um, does he love me, can I know him? And so those are, those are some of the questions that, that I encounter a lot, I think, especially as, as chaplain. For more from Father Justin, check out episode 22, The Hillbilly Thomist. Episode 23 was my interview with Alex Wakaluk, a computer programmer who has left the defense industry and now works in the mortgage industry. This excerpt is about one minute long, and it comes from the 21-minute mark in that interview. It's where I ask Alex what kind of advice he would give to potential philosophy majors. Here it is. Let me ask you the question of the show, which is, is there any advice that you would give to a student who's in the situation that you were in some, some years ago, eight, nine years ago, thinking about minoring or majoring in philosophy, but a little bit reluctant to do it? Is there anything that you could say either from your school experience or from your life experience since then that you think might be relevant to the kind of decisions that they're trying to make now? I, um, what I would say is that if you have a plan for what you want to do after graduation and you're thinking about adding philosophy, a philosophy degree to that, philosophy is going to supplement and color everything you do in more ways than you will realize. That's what I found with my life. That's from episode 23, The Programmer. Episode 24, the Monsignor is my interview with Monsignor McLean Cummings, who is my colleague at Mount St. Mary's Seminary, also never a student of mine. He studied philosophy at Harvard. In this short excerpt, he shares a story about the way in which the symbols of Harvard University have changed over time and what this reflects about the limits of human knowledge. This excerpt comes around the 17-minute mark in episode 24 and is a little less than two minutes long. Here it is. We, we are, in effect, living through a culture which is prioritizing avoidance of error over love of truth, and that the love of truth is, is kind of diminishing, withering away for, for lack of sustenance. Mm -hmm. But we really need, really need to awake either this sense of wonder or this, this desire for explanation, for, for something fully satisfactory that, that one can celebrate intellectually mm -hmm. as, as well as, as know and find. Um, maybe this fits in with, with a theme from Fides et Ratio about the desire for you know, a, a comprehensive uh, theory mm -hmm. of all things and not just being contented with the, the, the grains of truth that we get through right. uh, a more analytical and, and scientific method. Right. 
Well, that sounds that sounds very very true to me. Very very well put. Because um, that desire to be not to not be wrong, uh, it, it can be satisfied by limiting what one considers knowable to a very very you know very a very small level, very low level, mm -hmm. and you know mainly you know uh, things that are empirically uh, verifiable, mm -hmm. and and bigger questions that one could debate about, and also truths that being open to truths that we that are beyond us. Um, I don't know if you know this, but the um, the the shield at Harvard, um, which obviously says veritas, the veritas, the syllables of that word are written on three books, and so. The books, when you look at the shield, are open towards you. The mm -hmm. VE on one and the RI on the next and the TAS. But on the original shield, one of those books was turned upside down. And it was, it was to symbolize that there are truths that are beyond our ability to, to know or to know fully. Hmm. Mysteries of the faith. Because that you know, very toss was originally a religious concept of the truth of Jesus Christ. Um, but at some point, uh, in I don't I think the 19th century they they flipped all the books over. That's really interesting. Yeah. I wasn't aware of that. That's an interesting sort of symbolic it representation is. of the, yeah. the mystery at the heart of all of all knowledge at the at, at, the, at the limit. Yeah, that's, that's really true. fascinating. Mm -hmm. For the rest of my interview with Monsignor Cummings, please check out episode 24. The final episode of season two was my interview with Lexi Pintar a graduate from two years ago of Mount St. Mary's University, who's now married and expecting a child. When I was interviewing her, she's since had her baby, a little girl, on Holy Saturday. In this excerpt, we discuss the risks involved with getting married young, why people choose to do that. This excerpt comes at about the 24-minute mark in the episode and is seven minutes long. If you don't mind my asking one more question, I wonder what your perspective is on marrying and starting a family young. I don't know how old you are, but you are just two years past college, and here you are on the edge of motherhood. My oldest son just got married last year uh, at the age of 23, and I only mention these things because there, it's been observed the past decade or two that there's been a trend towards later and later marriage with people waiting until their late 20s or the early 30s even to get married and start a family. Do you have any thoughts or perspective on that, either through your own experience or just as a general observation about the, the kind of culture that, that we live in today? Yeah, <laughs> I have a lot of thoughts on it. So I, I got married at 23. I'm just about to turn 24. So yeah, I got married just about a year like almost exactly a year after I graduated from the Mount, my husband is, um, he's two years older than me. So he's 26. But getting married young was not something that I really had envisioned for myself, um, or at least getting married as, as quickly as I can. My husband and I were engaged less than a year after we had first met each other. And, you know, before that was me, I thought that people were crazy who did that. <laughs> there's like how could you marry someone and only know them for a year but you know things happen and and when you know you know and I think that there is this idea that that you have to be dating or you know whatever be in a relationship with someone for years before you get married in order to to really know them and I just don't think that that I don't, I don't see the logic in that because I don't think it's very difficult to figure out if you're supposed to marry someone or not. And I think a lot of times people, they, they want something out of the person that they're dating that they don't have yet, but they don't want to leave. Um, I think a lot of like modern, I mean, a lot of modern culture is really driven by fear, but especially a lot of modern dating culture, because it's like, if you leave this person, then it's like, oh no, who are you going to date? Um, but I think you know, for us, by the time that Jacob and I met, we had both had enough life experience where we both knew what we wanted. We knew that we wanted to get married and it was, it, and, you know, we decided, um, cause we, we dated long distance. So we met online. So I, I didn't even know him in person. And when 
when he was planning to come meet me for the first time, it was kind of like, okay, we're going to see, you know, either like, yes, we see value in pursuing this and we could see each other, see us marrying each other. Or, you know, if it doesn't work out, we're just going to say, see ya, never talk to each other again. And then that's going to be, that's going to be it. And thankfully for the both of us, when we met, it was, it was pretty clear to the both of us that, that there was a, a good chance that it was, that it was going to work out to so them, you know, we pursued a relationship with each other. And yeah, like you said, not something that I thought that I thought of myself doing. Um, I definitely thought that after, after graduation from the Mount, you know, that I was going to go, go to school. I was at le- like, I thought I was at least going to have like a master's degree before I got married. And then when I met, when I met Jacob, it's like, well, that would be silly of me to kind of leave behind this person and go in pursuit of higher education because, you know, and I had, I had some pushback, especially for members of my family who thought maybe that I was throwing away good academic prospects for the sake of getting married. But I I said to them, I was like, look, marriage is besides, you know, getting to heaven is like our first vocation, but then our primary vocation is either marriage or religious life. And then after that comes our vocation as, you know, a student or a a worker, whatever. So it's like, I have my primary vocation sitting right in front of me. My first obligation is always going to be to that. So that's kind of why, you know, I decided, you know, not to go, not to get a master's degree or whatever, and just to work for a little bit. Cause of course, you know, you need I mean, getting married takes money and, you know, you have to have something to live off of. So, yeah, so it was uh, quite a change of life plan for me. But, you know, I think that people have to remember that, you know, if they are called to marriage, that's that's your first obligation to pursue. And I'm not saying that you have to go on on dates every night of the week to try to find your spouse, because usually, well, at least how it happened for me, it kind of just fell in front of me when I wasn't even looking, you know, and in that sense, it felt very providential. And I think too, when my husband and I got married, I I also got, uh, we both got some pushback from our respective families about getting married at the age we did. And then when we announced that we were expecting about having a child when we are, you know, my husband is still in law school. So he's, you know, not working at a firm full time yet. Um, and they, and, you know, and then especially when I told them I was going to stay at home, everyone thought that we were crazy. <laughs> um, but it's one, it's one of those things where I think getting married young has the benefit of, um, you are mature enough and responsible enough to deal with the challenges of marriage and having a child. But when you're young, you also tend to be a little bit foolish. So it's like, maybe, I think sometimes, I think that our Lord designed us that way where, you know, young people are, you know, just foolish enough that they can actually, you know, trust that these sorts of, that these sorts of things will, will work out. You know, I think that if, if I was, you know, maybe 30 and had gotten married and was in the exact same situation, I think I probably would be a lot more reticent to, to quit my job and, you know, live off of only one income while one of us is still in school. So I think that when you're young, you're just, you're built to take risks, but a lot of people take risks in the form of, you know, other things that might not necessarily be the best for them, but this is the sort of risk, you know, that I actually, that I think is actually worth, worth taking of having a child and not really knowing how it's going to work out or what's going to happen or how we're going to pay rent in five months, Mm -hmm. you know, but you just have to trust. I mean, the first commandment that we get in the Bible is to be fruitful and multiply. You just have to trust that what the Lord has said is good for your life will actually be the best thing for your life. That's an excerpt from episode 25, The Expectant Mom. I hope you've enjoyed this quick look at some of the season two episodes of Life After Philosophy. Please check out and share individual episodes that you find interesting. 
and check back in summer of 2024 for the beginning of season three. Thank you for listening to Life After Philosophy. If you enjoyed the podcast, please rate it five stars and share this episode with a friend. I appreciate your support.